one pitch. And here's a high fly ball center field. Going back, Yelich to the track, to the wall, leaps. And Yelich came up with a ball, I believe, and banged into the wall. Yelich, right center. It's deep. Gone. Three run shot. 14th on the season for Yelich. Yelich, he got it. Yelich robs a home run. Well, here's a swing and a long drive. Kane at the wall. He leaps up and makes a terrific catch. Oh, Lorenzo Kane just took a home run away from Chris Davis. Opposite field home run. Lorenzo Kane. Two home run game. A bomb for Lorenzo Kane. The first three home run game in Lorenzo Kane's career. And what a night for Lorenzo Kane. Hey everyone, welcome to 1225 Live. My name is Alexa Dat. The hot stove is red hot. We had a huge night last night. We're going to break it all down today on the show as the biggest free agent contract of the offseason to date was signed last night. What does that mean for a fringe playoff team? Are they now potentially contenders for a World Series title? JP Morosi is going to join us in just a little bit, our MLB Network insider, and he will fill us in on that, as well as what kind of a ripple effect will this have on the rest of the free agent market? Market. So without further ado, let's talk about some of these new additions to the Brew Crew, Danny. The Brew Crew got a little bit better overnight, man. It's pretty cool to see, huh? It's very exciting. I, things are heating up. We were exchanging text messages. It's about to get really good in baseball. All right, so first off, around 6 p.m. here on the East Coast, as we were all checking Twitter and going through it all, the Brewers made a huge splash by trading for one of baseball's top young outfielders, Christian Yelich. But he came at a cost. Uh, besides their top-rated prospect, Back to Lewis Brinson, who was 13th overall according to MLB Pipeline, infielder Isan Diaz, outfielder Monte Harrison, and right-hander Jordan Yamamoto are all headed to Miami. By the way, Brinson, Diaz, and Harrison all part of the Brewers' top 10 prospects list. But they are going to get Christian Yelich, who hit 282 with 18 home runs, 81 RBI last year. And he is a career 290 hitter. Obviously, we heard that he wanted out of uh, Miami as they began their rebuilding process this offseason by trading away Jocko Stanton, D. Gordon, Marcelo Zuna, and now Christian Yelich. So he is headed to Milwaukee, but they weren't done after that. Uh, they added Lorenzo Kane. But before that happened, Christian Yelich went ahead and said his goodbyes to everyone down there in Miami. He said, We all grew up in this organization, went through the ups and downs. I've made some life long friends I'm very thankful wasn't always easy and fans I know you're upset it's hard knowing uh, what we had here and what we fell short of accomplishing but it's truly been a pleasure and I thank you all from the bottom of my heart pretty incredible very uh, heartfelt very thoughtful he's always been that guy pretty incredible to see uh, those words from Christian Yelich. Yeah, it's really nice to be able to see these guys give a shout out to the team and the fans and now they move on and the fans can still root for them, right? Yeah. All right, we continue on the timeline last night because that wasn't it. The Rooker were not done. A few short hours later they went ahead and uh, completed one of the biggest free agent signings. Actually, the biggest one in their franchise history. They add Lorenzo Kane, giving him the richest free agent contract this offseason. Five years, $80 million. He's 31 one years old flies around the outfield with that glove pretty incredible and he goes back to the place where it all started for him he was drafted by the Brewers in the 17th round in 2004 he spent a season in Milwaukee then was part of a trade package to go to the Royals for Zach Granke back in 2010 he was with the Royals for seven seasons remember he led them to that World Series title after falling short just the year before uh, pretty incredible numbers he put up last year and uh, Brewers lineup just got a little bit better Danny and it's going to be interesting to see what what uh, kind of damage they're able to do this season. Man, first of all, shout out to Adam McAlvey, Brewers reporter, who has probably been the busiest man in the last 24 hours. But if you are a fan of baseball or you're a fan of an NL Central team, you better be excited that the Brewers now have these two guys and things are going to be a lot more exciting. All right, so uh, the Brewer Brewers players were buzzing about this, which was, I think, the best part watching their reactions, Danny. So first, Travis Shaw reacting to the deal, a little Frank the Tank. Yes, <laughs> awesome. Punching the cereal. I do this uh, when I get excited about anything, really. Anything at all. Jimmy Nelson up next, dubbed Miller Park the Dinger Dome. Talking about Christian Yelich and Lorenzo Kane, adding a couple more dingers to that ballpark. Yeah, and the best was um, Shaw wasn't done. He <laughs> said he nearly fainted 
after hearing about the Lorenzo Cain news, which was pretty funny. Hopefully these guys stay healthy because Zach Davies was so excited that he might need to get a new phone. He got excited about the news and broke his phone watching Bernie slide. All year will make up for it, though, but he had a good enough phone to send out this congratulations tweet. And that leads us to our question of the day. After seeing these big moves, we want to know from you guys on Facebook, what have been some of your team's biggest acquisitions that have been some of your favorites? So if you're not on Facebook, head over right now and let us know some of your favorite acquisitions. The Cardinals got Matt Holiday in 2009. That was obviously a franchise-changing move for them and paid off for them. So Facebook let us know. We're going to read those comments at the end of the show. All right, sounds good. Yeah, I know a lot of Brewers fans have a lot to say about last night, but there are other fans out there who were just as excited as Brewers fans are today right. about acquisitions in the past for their team. So share it with us here today on the show, and we will share it a little bit later. All right, hot stove is hot, man. Uh, like we've been talking about, the Brewers stole the headlines last night. Pretty incredible. They acquire Christian Yelich for four top prospects and then sign Lorenzo Cain to a five-year, $80 million deal. Our, our MLB Network insider JP Morosi is joining us right now to break it all down JP thank you so much for joining us right now let's start with Lorenzo Cain he's back with the team that originally drafted him how big of an impact do you believe he's going to make with the Brewers Alexa right now this is one of the most stacked outfields anywhere in the major leagues and I love the fact that the Brewers play in the smallest local TV market in the major leagues and they have now made the biggest free agent signing of this entire offseason. I love that. They are now loudly declaring to the baseball world they are trying to win a World Series right now. They have never won the World Series before. They believe they can do it in 2018 with two massive moves at the very same time. And it also sets up, Alexa, a really nice cascading effect for them because they now have the flexibility of trading Domingo Santana, Orion Braun, Keon Broxton for some pitching. So they are not done yet. I think that's the best part about this move for the Brewers. They are not done. They know they have to upgrade their rotation with Jimmy Nelson being out to begin uh, the start of the season after the shoulder surgery. So uh, David Stearns at the beginning of his third full season as the Brewers GM really putting himself, the franchise, everybody on the clock. They are trying to win right now. They've recognized coming off an 86-win season. This is their window to win, and that, I think they really declared that with two moves, two huge moves, last night. So do you think that they just made the NL wildcard race a lot more competitive? Are they going for the division? You think they can compete with the Cubs? Where do you think they fall right now in terms of a playoff race? They are going for the division. There's no question about that, Alexa. They believe they can beat the Cubs. They finished six games back of the Cubs last year. But remember, go back to the All-Star break. Before the Jose Quintana trade to the Cubs, it really, I think, revitalized the Cubs going into the second half. The Brewers had a pretty sizable lead on the Cubs in the National League Central. So I think when you make an acquisition like this, as you mentioned, the largest free agent signing in the history of the club with Lorenzo Cain, and they get a player in Christian Yelich who was a star for Team USA at the World Baseball Classic last year, was batting third for Team USA in that tournament. You acquire these two guys on the same day, you're making a very bold statement. Now, the Cubs may well counter in the coming days by signing you Darvish or doing something else, but I think the Cubs right now, their rotation maybe started to show some age in 2017, and also at the moment, they're minus Jake Arrieta. So if, if they're going to, obviously now they, they did sign Tyler Chatwood, but if they're going to make a, a, a play right now for the Cubs, it's almost as though they have to sign Darvish or someone like him to just get back to where they were as a rotation in 2017. The Brewers, though, they have to do the same thing, I believe, with Jimmy Nelson being out to begin the season. They have got to find a way to get one more starting pitcher. But fortunately for Milwaukee and David Stearns, they now have a trade chip in Domingo Santana to go out and make that trade happen. All right, so like you mentioned, Brewers still looking for that starting pitcher, and they would like to uh, acquire him by potentially, like you said, trading away some of these outfielders. Who do you believe is the most likely starter that could end up in Milwaukee? Well, two names I'll give you right now off the top. Chris Archer, the, the price tag is going to be a bit higher, I believe, than Domingo Santana to get Archer. I think the Rays would say no if it was Santana for Archer straight up. But I love that possibility for Milwaukee. He's perfect. Uh, he's been involved in so many pennant races there in the American League East. I think nothing about the National League Central would, would shock or surprise or intimidate Chris Archer. So I would love that possibility for Archer there. Also, pay very close attention to the Cleveland Indians. They've got Danny Salazar. They've got Mike Clevenger. 
And interestingly, looking at the, the list of teams that pursued uh, Lorenzo Cain, according to Jerry Krasnick, the Indians were on that list. And that tells me that they are a little bit concerned about whether it's the injury history of a Michael Brantley and Lonnie Chisenhall or the long-term picture for them. The Indians have an all-left-handed hitting outfield, and two of those players, Brantley and Chisenhall, as I mentioned, free agents after 2018. So the Indians already looking to the future. They know they have a, an abundance of starting pitching. So that, to me, is a very natural trade fit for someone in, in Domingo Santana who hit 30 home runs last year and is only 25 years old. That type of player, Alexa, has immense value on the trade market right now. JP, we've been waiting for a lot of these big names to start moving, and uh, with the signing of Lorenzo Cain, I feel like this could maybe open up a, a little bit more of the floodgates. We'd like to see them open, but uh, it's been more of a trickle effect, if anything. What do you think this kind of ripple effect will be with the signings of Yelich and Cain? How much of an effect will this have on the free agent market? Well, I think it will have some effect, and I think the most notable one could be what it means for you, Darvish, and the Cubs. The Cubs now perhaps having to answer the big moves of their division rival there with Milwaukee. That may push Darvish and the Cubs a bit closer together because, as well, we had thought about Milwaukee being a fit for Darvish, but now having spent, as you pointed out, the most money they've ever spent on a free agent player in Kane, I have a hard time seeing the Brewers' budget fitting a U Darvish signing as well. So I think much more likely for, for Milwaukee, they'll go trade market for a starter, which eliminates one suitor for Darvish and maybe pushes the Cubs and Darvish a bit closer to a union there. I also think looking bigger picture uh, with the market overall, I still don't see a huge connection between this signing uh, and J.D. Martinez. Martinez, the Boston J.D. Martinez staring contest, continues. Uh, maybe the Diamondbacks have a way uh, of finding a way to keep J.D. Martinez, but I, I, again, I really think that for him, the most likely spot is the Boston Red Sox for J.D. Martinez. And then I think once the, the Darvish piece goes off the board, then that next tier of pitching, Alex Cobb, Lance Lynn, I think those possibilities start to coalesce. But also, I'll make this point as well, the Marlins probably aren't done trading yet. I think that they still may have some trades to make. A uh, report yesterday from Craig Mish about talks between the Marlins and Nationals about JT Real Muto. I was told by a source this morning, in fact, that the interest for the Nationals and JT Real Muto goes back now the last two years, Alexa. So this is not a, a recent revelation. And I was struck by that picture that we showed a moment ago of the Marlins outfield. Osuna, Stanton, Yelich all gone and and really their big piece that's still left they've even traded d gordon as well the big piece to move jt real muto three years of control the nationals they probably feel even more urgency than the brewers do to win in 2018 we know of course the nationals just one more year with bryce harper before he becomes a free agent and who knows uh, the richest hill encounter in free agency next winter yeah but jp the big thing and the sticking point in a deal between the nationals and the marlins for jt real muto would be their top overall prospect victor robles they don't want to let go of him he's such an asset for this team do you see these two actually coming together for a deal to be made because they don't want to give him up it's a great question, Alexa, and I would say this. The Marlins set that very same price tag as a starting point for Christian Yelich. They said, I need your best prospect. I, whoever it is, I need your best guy. Uh, it would have been Ronald Acuna if it was the Braves. Didn't happen. So the Brewers eventually met that price with Lewis Brinson. You look at the situation there with the Nationals and the Marlins, the Nationals do have Soto as well in the minor leagues, very highly regarded outfield prospect, maybe not quite as good as Victor Robles, but it would be that type of player. And again, for a catcher uh, that you would control for three more years, who's already a proven player at the major league level, we love prospects. I love prospects. It's a great part about being a baseball fan, but there's something to be said for the proven commodity. And JT Real Muto, uh, according to Fangraphs.com, wins above replacement, Alexa. He is the second most valuable catcher in the major leagues after Buster Posey in the last two seasons. JT Real Muto is an all-star caliber catcher. Those types of players do not come around and become available very often. Yeah, and it was one of the biggest weaknesses for the Nationals last season. So definitely an area of improvement uh, they are they're looking at. So let's talk about this Marlins team now. They are collecting prospects like it's going out of style. And uh, a lot of these guys, those big names that you mentioned, have left. What is the future of the Miami Marlins? 
Well, I think it's uh, exactly what they are seeing uh, play out in Milwaukee and what they've seen play out before in Houston and even Chicago to an extent. What you're seeing in Miami right now, Alexa, is a very comprehensive plan. And Michael Hill has been there. He, was, he won a World Series ring with the Marlins in 2003. He's been part of the buildups and, unfortunately, the teardowns as well. I think now with the new ownership group, uh, Bruce Sherman, Derek Jeter, I think there is now a comprehensive strategy of how to develop this, this franchise from the ground up and I think rebuild the trust with the fan base. It's not going to be easy, but I think if you look around the game and, and fans in Miami will, will, I think, be very astute about seeing what's happened in other places, the trust that Derek Jeter has and the front office, again, Michael Hill, Bruce Sherman, um, it works. The process has worked. It's worked in Chicago. It's worked in Houston. It worked to a degree in Kansas City. It is working right now in Milwaukee. It doesn't work all the time. We should be careful to say it's not a guarantee where if you have this process of rebuilding that there is definitely a championship coming in the mail to you in three years. It doesn't quite work that way. But I think, I think if, you, if you have the right checkpoints, you follow those procedures like we're seeing with the Marlins, you do have a chance to win a championship. And I think that with some of the trades they've made, the players they've gotten back, Brinson, a great prospect, Alcantara, the player they got from the, the top pitcher they got from the Cardinals in the Osuna trade, very good prospect as well. And they got some salary relief in the deal with Stanton to help them plan for the future. So, so I think right now, uh, is, it a, is it a foolproof strategy to win a championship? No, but I do think it's a strategy that certainly has worked for other teams right now in Major League Baseball. Three words for Marlins fans. Trust the process. That's really all we can give right yes. now. And uh, <laughs> hopefully good things are uh, on the horizon. All right, Daniel's watching us here on Facebook. JP, he says hi. He's also a big Yankees fan. So he says Yankees are looking to make another splash this offseason, trying to stay under the luxury tax, though. How much money is available for them to spend, and who do you see them potentially adding? It's a great question, Daniel, and I would say this. I wrote about this section at MLB.com this week about the overall Yankee plan, and here's how the numbers look. We know $197 million is where they want to stay below this year because of the luxury tax threshold and the, their need to sort of reboot that level of luxury tax entering next winter's class with Harper and Machado and so many great players, Kershaw as well. So at the moment, according to Cots Baseball Contracts, they are at $162 million of commitments. So you would think, does that give them $35 million to spend? Not quite, because they want to budget in about $10 million, perhaps even more, for bonuses and other obligations, insurance, uh, benefits. That's all part of the luxury tax calculation. Also, they want to get, budget about $10 million or so for the trade deadline. Now, maybe they can borrow against that, if you will, uh, by making more moves right now, but they want to give themselves a cushion. If there's some injuries, they want to be able to make some trades in July that aren't necessarily cash neutral for their club. Uh, so right now, Alexa probably leaves them about seven or probably about $15 million or so to make improvements right now. Will you Darvish fit under that cap of $15 million? Probably not, but maybe Mike Moustakis will. Maybe Todd Frazier will. Maybe Neil Walker will. There's a lot of youth on that infield right now at both third base and second base. I am of the mind the Yankees will find some way between now and opening day to add a veteran infielder, whether it's Frazier, whether it's Walker. And again, Mike Moussaka is probably the best fit uh, at third base. I think they'll look to, to improve there and then perhaps as the year goes along, trade for a, a healthy pitcher in June or July if there's a necessity there rather than go out there and spend $20 million a year or whatever it's going to take for you, Darvish. Makes sense. All right, JP, thanks for all the info. Really appreciate it. One of our best MLB insiders in the business. Uh, we'll talk soon and enjoy your weekend. Have a great weekend. Thanks so much. The hot stove has been ignited, it's Alexa. It's been ignited. I, love it. I know. We love it. We absolutely <laughs> love it, and we can't wait for more. Thanks, JP. All right, uh, speaking of MLB Network, they had an amazing ride-along with two players who were just announced as Hall of Famers, Chipper Jones and Jim Tomey, and they were talking about their relationship and uh, how they kind of first got to know each other. And the funniest thing was they shared this amazing story of the time that they encountered each other in the minors. If you haven't heard this story, you got to listen. Take a look. We were nip and tuck the whole year, our, our two teams. You know, we were chasing them, they were chasing us. We didn't like them. They didn't like us, you know. Bill Works. Bill Works, my boy from Cleveland. Throws a, like a 96 mile an hour fastball behind Klesko, all right? So we clear, nothing happens, right? Everybody's just kind of jawing and whatnot. 
we get back on, you know, you know, Klesko gets back in the box, Wirtz gets back on the mound, Wirtz throws him a heater down the middle, and Klesko flings the bat over Wirtz's head into center field. Well, it's on now, okay? So we come piling out, they come piling out, and the next thing I know, it's like the hand of God grabs me around the throat, okay? All right, and my face is up against the backstop like this, and all I can hear is, don't you move. And I look over, and that hand of God was Jim Tomei's hand. We've been boys ever since. So it, 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 the, the story is correct, all of it. <laughs> it is, it is. But, but I think what it was is we were trying to end the brawl. If you, if you come in contact with somebody, the heat of the moment puts you in the situation to either move them or you get moved. <laughs> Just a very calm, hey man, if you want to keep your head, don't <laughs> move. Danny, I can't wait till we have our own Chipper Jones, Jim Tomey moment, because that's going to be pretty epic, and we're going to definitely get it on film. I hope that it's on film. It might be better if it's not, but for our sakes, hopefully it'll be on film. All right, we've been highlighting Emily Pipeline's uh, top prospects at each position, and they've been going through all these lists throughout the week. So we're going to piggyback off of that uh, today. and We've been doing it throughout the week here on the show, talking about the best player at each position. We've been through pitchers and yeah. catchers. Now we're going to talk about some of the infielders. We're going to start today talking about first baseman, Danny. So give me your best first baseman right now in baseball. All right. I am going with a guy who has gold in his actual name. <laughs> Paul Goldschmidt. Goldie, as he's affectionately called, is my best first baseman. Let's look at some of the accolades. Gold Glover, Silver Slugger, Big Daddy Hacker, five-time All-Star. So those are just some of the things he earned last year. He's been playing on an average team, in my humble opinion, for, for pretty long. And he's a guy who is really doing it all for that team. He puts them on his shoulders, and he's one of the best. He's humble, he's quiet, he's manning the corner. From ages 24 to 29, he's accumulated 34.4 wins above replacement. That's that war that we're always talking about. That's a huge, huge stat. And listen, in his 30th year of baseball, he had 5.8. So for me, that guy is everything you want in a first baseman. He knows how to play the field. He knows what he's doing at the plate. And he's a leader. He's number one. Yes, he's one of the best first basemen, but he's not the best, Danny. The best first <laughs> baseman right now in baseball is Joey Votto. The former MVP, this guy is lights out, has some of the best plate discipline we've ever seen. Finished top 10 in MVP voting in six of his 11 seasons, five-time All-Star. In 2016, do you remember he hit 408 after the All-Star break? He joined a handful of players, uh, of the only guys to be able to do that in history. Then last year, he was runner-up to Stanton for the NL MVP award. A lot of people were upset he didn't win it. <laughs> And for good reason, his OBP and war are absolutely off the charts. Uh, and like I mentioned, his plate discipline, uh, plate discipline unlike anything in the sport. In 2017, let me just read you this. He swung at just 15% of the pitches that he saw outside of the strike zone. That was the lowest rate in baseball. It's amazing. He just he, he can foresee what's coming at him and uh, know whether he should be swinging or not. It's incredible. They are the NL uh, brethren. They are, I'm sure, hopefully friends maybe off the field too because those guys are two of the best in our game. Another yeah. best in our game, Bartolo Colon, who is, by the way, less than one year younger than Chipper Jones, but is still trying to play baseball in 2018. Mm -hmm. And we got a chance to look at his no offseason throwing program in the Dominican. Yeah, that's right. Big sexy, sexy in the DR. <laughs> uh, showing off that gas is waiting for a call for uh, someone from the big leagues to pick up the phone. Let's make it happen, people. Let's get Bartolo Colon back here in the States playing for one of our 30 teams. That would be electric. Really just to, to see him on the mound would be incredible at 44 years old. Uh, that would be amazing. But also to see him perform, because I still do think he's got something left, would be pretty incredible. Give the people what they want. Just want give the sexy. people what they want. He can eat some innings for you. Give him a chance. Yeah, that's right. He just all wants right. to play. Question of the day, Danny? Yes, all right. So, up. listen, the Brewers are doing big things. They are they reignited, as you and John Morosi talked about. The stove, the hot stove is brewing. I didn't make that joke up. Ah, one good of, one. One of our friends on Facebook did. He said we missed out on an opportunity. But we asked you guys, what were some of your favorite 
acquisitions that your team's gotten over the years that have changed the course of that franchise. So if you're on Facebook now, send those in, but I'm going to read a couple of them that we got in here. Alex said Jake Arrieta in 2013 for the Cubs, obviously a huge deal because they went on to end that 108-year drought. He was a really big part of that. Matthew said the Jays with Josh Donaldson. Mm. We're going to find out where that guy's going uh, pretty soon, staying with the Jays. Moving on, Brian said Verlander to the Astros last year, which was humongous. He said he went crazy when I heard it finally went through. And then you're going to love this one. Justin said uh, Giancarlo Stanton to the Yankees. Yeah, of course. That was a pretty big deal, huh? Yeah. I remember as a Nationals fan, I'm sitting there on my couch late Sunday night, January 2015. Chilly? Yeah, chilly <laughs> January night. And uh, across my phone is a seven-year deal for Max Scherzer, somewhere in the uh, in the neighborhood of $200 million, something like that. And uh, it was pretty excited. You didn't stutter that. on that million. <laughs> uh, Brian said Joey Gallo for the Rangers. Anthony Rizzo in 2012 for the Cubs, says Rowan. Sean said Pedro Martinez to the Red Sox. So, mm. You guys are right. There have been some major, major moves to make your teams even better than they already are. But we're hoping that teams don't slow down because we still have a couple weeks until pitchers and catchers report. we got a lot of but names on that board. We have tons of free agents yeah. left. It's incredible. We got so excited about one free agent signing, the biggest one of the offseason so far last night. But there's still so many big names on the board. It's incredible. So, uh, yeah. Time's ticking. Time's ticking. Let's but go. There's going to be a lot of magic. This hot stove is going to uh, uh, malfunction. That's right. With the way it's Less gone than so three far. weeks. Yeah. Let's go, people. All right. Our final story of the week today here on 1225 okay. Live. This is for everyone out there in New Jersey or <laughs> who has ever lived in New Jersey or has ever eaten a delicious pork roll sandwich in New Jersey, Danny. Yes. Uh, this is from the state capital of New Jersey, to be specific. The okay. Trenton Thunder are celebrating their 25th anniversary this year. And they're doing it in a way that only New Jersey can appreciate. And what we're talking about, pork rolls, they're going to become the Trenton pork roll for each and every Friday night game. May 18th will also serve as dollar pork roll sandwich night. That sounds dangerous. I did have my first pork roll today, Lex, courtesy of our friend Marissa, our helpful producer, and it was delicious, I must say. It's not something that I would eat every morning, pork and cheese, but it was really good. Yeah, it's funny because some people call it Taylor ham. And so we will call it pork roll. But if you are in New Jersey, especially a fan of the Trenton Thunder, you definitely call it a pork roll. And it's absolutely delicious. Put it with some cheese, put it on a bagel. You melt the cheese, uh, get it in the toaster oven, and uh, it's delicious. Maybe we'll have to go. We have, might have to go to Trenton yeah. and try one of their pork rolls. Maybe on the dollar pork roll night. So how many pork rolls do you think you could eat? Uh, I think we asked this question for another food. I think, to be honest, my limit's one. One pork roll Just seems like one? plenty. It has oh, two man. pieces. You're disappointing of everyone in New I'm Jersey not. right now. Well, I can do five. That's not even true. Yeah. We'll roll this tape back when you don't eat five. Well, put five in front of me. I'll eat it right now. All right. Well, you know what? Save you don't the have tape. Pork roll. Happy Friday. We're going to Trenton. We're going on a road trip, and you're not eating five pork rolls. May 18th, be there, and I will <laughs> prove you all wrong. I will be able to do it. And Danny. Uh, you will then... I'll be there to hold your hair back. There you go. <laughs> Don't worry. That's what I'm here you for. You can carry the doggy bag full of the, uh, the leftovers. That's right. All right, Danny. thanks so much. Awesome week. Have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, have a great weekend. See you Monday. Okay. And same goes to everyone who was watching the show all week long, especially today. Uh, really appreciate it. We'll see you Monday. Uh, MLB.com, leave it right here if you want to check out any of the latest free agent signings, where uh, potential trades could be brewing because we got all the info. So uh, make sure that you keep it locked right here. And then anything happens over the weekend, we will let you know all about it. Break it down on Monday right here on 1225 Live. Hey, great weekend, everyone. See you Monday.